Alright, so I don't want to be specific about the location, but this happened around Pennsylvania. Most I'll say is that I don't live close enough to any metropolitan area worth noting, thus my drives are long, lonely, and even smelly. I was doing Chinese food deliveries, and to be frank, I was getting sick of it. I can't even eat Chinese anymore. The smell of the food has become so embedded in my nose and brain that I can't even bring myself to put the food in my mouth without gagging. I was rolling up to the restaurant for the next pickup of the night. I'm surprised as the bagging lady kept handing me bags, over ten of them. Busy night, I guess. Lots of orders? She shakes her head. Nope. Only one guy. As she hands me the ticket, I see the bill is massive, floating around $500. I'm looking at the address, and even though it's pretty far away, I'm kind of excited because generally those kinds of massive orders means one heck of a tip. I begin driving and taking in the details just in case this dude orders again in the future. The place is completely remote, and I can see the key road features disappearing as I go further along. First, the sidewalks stop running alongside the roads. After that, the street lamps then the white lines on the ground and soon after I start hitting random gravel beds. I thought to myself that this better be worth it and pray that I don't snap my axle or something else. I arrive at the address and it's literally just a stop in the road in the middle of nowhere. No driveway, no signs, not even a mailbox. Thinking my GPS was bugged out, I decided to call the guy to clarify the address. Of course, no answer. I'm starting to think that I got lured into the middle of Hick Woods just to get murdered, and as I was starting to dial the restaurant to confirm the address, I see another car oncoming with its headlights shining on me. I'm like a gazelle frozen in fear. I see the car slowing down near me, accepting my end, dead from a drive-by shooting I was thinking. The car stops right next to me and slowly rolls down its window. My tension goes down as I realize that He's just a pizza delivery driver. He asked me if this is the place and I realized that we couldn't have both had GPS mess ups at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, this is the place. They ordered pizza? Yeah, huge order too. He seemed really excited for the same reason as me initially. I don't even have time to say anything else and another figure comes out from the bush. He's holding a flashlight but isn't pointing it at anything, just a little off to the side, and he stutters. Hey, hey, hey guys, F food? Something is really uncanny about him, and I felt even more uncomfortable than a minute before when I thought that I would get got by a drive-by. He's standing in a painfully bad posture, like visible scoliosis that you could identify at a glance. He snaps the flashlight directly at my face, blinding me, and says, Thank you for arrive, arriving f first. He snaps the light to the other driver's face, and now with a clear voice he says, You lose. The other driver and I look at each other with a mix of fear and perplexion. I decide to get out of the car and start unpacking the bags, which wasn't the best move in hindsight. He snaps the light to a spot on the road. Here, P -p please He keeps alternating between lighting the spot and the other driver's face. What's your problem, man? He shouts while covering his eyes. I can tell the tension was rising, and though I'm not enjoying this, I feel the best course of action is to finish the delivery and just get away from here. When my stuff is completely unpacked, I try to assist my pizza bro, but the creep blinds me with the lights and hisses. Don't help! in a clear voice again. I hold my hands up and go back to my car, waiting for the delivery guy to finish as I decide to not leave him alone with this guy. During this downtime, I finally get a good look at him. The guy is actually way taller than his awful posture made him look, at least over six feet. I'm rattled as this delivery guy kept dropping the pizzas on the road, cussing under his breath. I start texting my boss on the verge of a panic attack telling him I'm taking the night off after this one. As I lift my head from the phone and look back at them, I can see the delivery guy staring at me with wide eyes. He moves his head in a way as if to say look behind you, and I jump as I see the gangly dude right next to my driver's window. 
He points down and says sharply, Window! Too terrified to even contest it, I oblige, and he slips in a bunch of bills through the window before it has even finished opening. Then what I saw next I'll never forget. The guy stood up straight and jumped over my car. I could hear two distinct thuds on my roof. I saw the pizza guy bolting away, and before he could even open his door, I saw the lanky guy catching up to him. The most uncanny run I had ever seen, I could only describe it as running a beanbag race without the beanbag. My head went blank, and before I could see him catch him, I floored it and just get out of there. And for 15 minutes, I'd drive with adrenaline pumping through my veins, expecting the guy to be on the road behind, running after me every time I look in the rearview mirror. I don't even go back to the restaurant and decide to head straight up home. I down half a handle of whiskey, and I just knock myself out. For a while, I was too nervous to go on deliveries, or anywhere for that matter. I even had a dream about this creep. There's been a missing person case for the pizza delivery guy, and they concluded that his car had skidded off the road since it was found wrapped around a tree. No sign of him, though. The pictures showed a destroyed vehicle and thousands of dollars worth of food on the ground, completely torn apart. This story took place about six to seven years ago when I was dating my college girlfriend. We were staying at her parents' house while they were out of town for a business conference in Phoenix. She had a lot of pets that needed to be taken care of, a bunch of fish and a few guinea pigs and a rabbit. I never realized how much work some of them were, cutting up lettuce, cleaning cages and whatever else went into the maintenance. Anyway, the night started out like any other. We were just watching TV. Actually, I think we were watching the Disney movie Heavyweights, if any of you are familiar with that movie. There is a scene where the entire camp absolutely pigs out on junk food. Once I saw the pizza, I knew that's what I wanted for dinner. Not good pizza, though. I was in the mood for Papa John's. I love their plain breadsticks and all the different sauces that come with them, and for some reason, that's what I was in the mood for. My girlfriend begrudgingly agreed, but asked if we could pick it up instead of being delivered. After I took a look outside, I told her that we should just have it delivered as the weather was getting really nasty out. It was a mixture of sleet, snow, and rain. She agreed, but asked if I would call in the order, and I didn't mind. I called in and paid with a tip included so they could just leave it at the door. They said it would take around half an hour or 45 minutes to deliver, which seemed reasonable to me. But after an hour and a half, I was starting to get hungry. I knew the roads were wet and honestly felt kind of bad for ordering it, as her parents' house was probably a good 7-8 miles away from the pizza place. Just as I was beginning to give up on the fact that food would never arrive, I saw headlights pulling up the long driveway. But as the vehicle got closer to the house, the lights stayed on with no movement. No one got in or out of the car, it was just parked there for a good 5 minutes. I opened up the door and waved them on trying to acknowledge that this was the right place. Still, no movement as the headlights glared right at my face. Then suddenly the headlights went off, but the car wasn't moving closer to the house, it was moving further away. The car was backing up down the driveway and heading towards the road. I was both confused and increasingly hangry. I called the shop and asked for the status of the delivery and if I should cancel due to the weather. They told me that the delivery driver should have been there as they left a while ago. My girlfriend also seemed overly concerned or anxious about the whole situation. I told her it wasn't a big deal and if worse came to worse, we well, could just make a sandwich or something. Still, I could tell something was wrong and that her mood had suddenly shifted. I tried to brush it off and not pry, and as soon as we pressed play on the TV, we heard a huge bang at the door. It was like someone was pounding on it as hard as they could. We both jumped up, eyes darting toward the door. I told her to stay behind the couch and just let me go check. I told her that I'm sure that it was just the delivery guy leaving the food at the door. And I was right. The food was sitting on the porch and I didn't see a sign of a person or vehicle which I thought was peculiar. I brought the food inside and locked the door, then put it on the counter so we could start eating. When I opened the breadstick box, there was a napkin inside that looked like it had been written on with red pen. It said, I hope you enjoy, XOXO. 
I showed my girlfriend and her face turned white. I asked her what was going on and why she was acting weird. She then said that one of her exes, Sean, used to work at Papa John's or maybe still did. She didn't want to make a big deal of it as she was sure that it would be a non-issue, but she said that she thought the car that had pulled into the driveway earlier looked like his old car, at least the one that she remembered from when they were dating. But she said that he always used to leave her notes that had XOXO at the bottom. Even after they broke up, she said that he would leave them on her car. She said that when she decided to leave him, he didn't take it well and began contacting her non-stop trying to get back together and mailing and leaving her letters. She said that after she changed her number and made her social media accounts private, she never heard from him again and never had any further issues. I really didn't know what to say. I wanted to say I'm sure this one was a big coincidence, but I didn't know if it was or wasn't. I told her that anybody that was here is now gone as I didn't see a person or car outside. I told her that we should skip dinner and go to bed if she wanted, but she said she was fine and that we should eat. About 15 to 20 minutes after we got done eating, we heard another loud crash coming from outside. It sounded like glass or ice had been hurled against the sliding glass kitchen. Again, I told her to stay in the living room while I went to check it out. The motion sensor was activated in the backyard, but I didn't see anyone or anything. I didn't see anything that could have hit the glass. Nothing was broken that I could see. I asked if she wanted me to call the police, and she was reluctant. One of her parents would have to be notified, and she said she really didn't have any proof that someone was there. We decided to call it an early night and try to get some sleep. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to sleep much. My anxiety was definitely going to keep me up most of the night. Thankfully, the remainder of the night was uneventful. It was 3 a.m. and we hadn't heard or seen anything else. However, to this day I swear that I heard scratching and whispering from 3 a.m. on to the morning. I felt like someone was outside the window, but every time I shifted the blinds to look, nothing was there. In the morning, I chalked it up to the animals making noise maybe to make myself believe or feel better about the situation from the night before. To my knowledge, nothing else came from the incident and my girlfriend at the time never had another weird occurrence. We broke up a few years later, but almost every single time I order pizza I think about that night and I half expect there to be a note in my pizza box. Most people out there have experienced some sort of heartbreak and everybody deals with this crisis differently and in their own way. For me, it was a pizza and shamefully tinder, both of which usually left me feeling like a truck hit me. After a few, let's call them tinder dates, I decided that I was done with tinder, at least for a while. Things get weird and almost scary sometimes. I decided that the best way to deal with this loneliness was to order an amazing loaded french fry pizza. I'll say this, if you've never experienced the glorious bounty of a loaded french fry pizza, you need to change that immediately. I ordered my pizza, and about 45 minutes later the doorbell rang. It was a beautiful woman delivering my pizza as well. I know anybody can deliver a food, but I personally have never seen a woman so gorgeous delivering pizza at that time. I made some stupid jokes when I answered the door and she giggled. I figured it was now or never to make a move. Strike while the iron's hot, I suppose. So, I just asked if she wanted to hang out, and to my surprise, she said that when she was done with work after this delivery that she'd love to chill. I was pumped, and perhaps more pumped than my pizza. She said she needed to go home and freshen up, and then she would head over at around 10pm. We exchanged numbers, and I decided that I probably should freshen up myself. 10 o'clock came, and she never showed up. I waited a bit, and then finally texted her and asked her where she was. I never received a text back until about 11.15. I was angry at this point, but as soon as she said she was coming over, I forgot how angry I was and agreed to still let her come. Before I knew it, it was midnight and she still wasn't there. I finally started listening to my brain for once and I decided to text her and tell her not to come. She texted back and claimed that she was almost there and that she really wanted to hang out. I was upset and decided that it would probably be like all my other Tinder dates if I let her come over, so I stuck to my guns and told her that I wanted to pass out for tonight and that maybe we can hang out again in the future. She responded with a simple text that was just a laughing face emoji. 
A weird response, I thought, but I shrugged it off and decided to go to bed. I had no idea what time it was, but it was at some point in the middle of the night I was awoken by my doorbell. I cautiously made my way to the door and there was nobody there. Directly behind the front door is my living room and in the living room is a back door that leads to my backyard. As I was staring at the front door, I thought I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned around and I swore that I saw someone running by my back door. I snuck over to that door and I thought I could hear giggles and whispers through the door. I couldn't make out any words and I guess it could have been the wind, but it definitely sounded like voices. A few moments later, my worst fears came true. While I was sitting next to the back door, I looked up across the room at the front door and at the door were what I believed to be five people. Whoever was standing in front then started to ring the doorbell repeatedly. I yelled from the other side of the room, What do you want? They stopped at the doorbell and then a deep, burly voice responded, We want to hang out. Don't you want to hang out? I shouted back a threat that I was going to call the police, but I had no intention of calling them if the threat worked. And then I heard a bubbly female voice shouting, They would never get here in time. Now the panic started to take me over. I ran back to my room and grabbed my phone to call the police. The entire time I was in my room, they kept ringing my doorbell and banging on the door. I half expected them to break the door down at any point. About five minutes later, I could see the lights of the cop car shining through my window and I ran back to the living room. The group of people was gone and I let the cops inside so I could give a statement. I told them about the girl at the pizza shop and that I was sure that it was her and most likely her friends. The cops didn't seem too interested if I'm being honest. They asked if I had seen any cars either when the woman delivered my pizza or when I had the alleged intruders and sadly, I didn't see the car either time. They asked if I had any proof that it was this girl and of course, I didn't. I didn't even know the girl's name. She was listed as pizza girl on my phone. Unfortunately, you can't charge someone based on feeling. I tried texting her that night and she responded right away, indicating me that she was awake and she claimed that I was insane. She could be right, and I was unfortunately just targeted by a group of freaks that night and this poor girl was just caught in the crossfire, but I don't think so. Everything just seemed off from the beginning. She agreed to hang out with a stranger after delivering a pizza, yes, more weird things have happened, but it does raise a red flag. Claiming she would be over at 10 and then she just kept postponing, saying that she was almost there. Then the weird laughing text, and then the intruders saying things like, do I want to hang out? It just seemed weird and oddly suspicious. Nothing has ever happened since that night, but I can tell you for sure that I don't sleep well anymore. The story I'm going to share took place a little over 11 years ago. At the time, I was a nurse at one of our local hospitals and working primarily on the cardiology floor. I was a relatively new employee at the facility, so I was taking pretty much any shift I could get. A lot of my shifts were overnight shifts or shifts that started late afternoon and went through to the middle of the night. At the time, I didn't mind, but looking back on it now, I have no idea how I wasn't in bed by 10pm every night like I am now. There are probably a thousand experiences I've had throughout my career that would make for an interesting story but there is one that sticks out more than others and still bothers me to this day. On the cardiac floors, we allowed different visitation rules than some of our other floors. Due to the sometimes unexpected and catastrophic nature of the illnesses, it wouldn't be uncommon to have visitors get approved to stay a majority of the day or night. If a spouse had just experienced a heart attack, it was natural to have someone stay the night even if they had been stabilized and moved to our floor. There was one particular patient who had their spouse with them for two to three days as they recovered and worked to get discharged and released home. They were both very nice people, especially my patient who still remains one of the sweetest people I'd ever met. Her husband, who was nice enough even from the beginning, seemed to have something a little off. I remember the wide smile that he would have when talking to me or coworkers. At first it seemed kind and inviting, but after holding a few minutes of conversation it got kind of uncomfortable. Anyway, the first occurrence happened on the second night of the stay. I was working an overnight shift and it was later in the evening. I was at the nurse's station and saw the light flashing outside the patient's room which notified me that they had used the call button to request something. I made my way to the room and went in to check and see what was going on. 
When I got there, the lights were off, but the TV was on and the patient looked to be sleeping. I was kind of confused and thought that maybe the patient accidentally hid it in their sleep. Then I heard, Smells good, right behind my ear. I jumped and kind of shrieked and saw that it was the patient's husband. He said, Oh, it was just me playing a little joke and hiding in the bathroom. He stammered and said, Oh, yeah, sorry, you Your hair smells good. I just kind of stood there in silence for a second and replied, Uh, please let me know if there's anything else either of you need. Just only use the call bell if you guys actually need assistance, okay? I left the room and went back to the nurse's station, which sat directly across from a bank of elevators. The location was annoying because the old elevators made a loud noise when they went up or down. A few hours had passed and the elevator was making its oh-so-lovely sound again and it dinged to open the doors to our floor. I looked around the desk but no one was there and the doors closed and the elevator went back down. Weird, right? Well, this happened five more times in a row so I finally decided to see who was messing around and calling or sending the elevator. I got into the elevator and it went down to the second floor where the doors opened. Again, no one was there. And being annoyed, tired, and confused at this point, I went back up to my floor to head back to my desk. When I got back up, the elevator had thankfully stopped its constant noise and movement. However, when I reached for my cup of water, I noticed a folded piece of paper. I thought maybe it was something I left in on one of the patient's rooms, or that it was something that I wrote down that I didn't want to forget to do. But when I unfolded it, it said, For my favorite nurse with a small drawing of a rose or some type of flower. I sat it down and looked around to see if there was anyone around. I didn't see anyone outside of another nurse who was all the way at the other end of the hallway coming out of another room. Thankfully, I was able to keep myself busy for most of the night and it was almost time for me to hand off my patients to the next shift. As I was finishing some paperwork, I felt a feeling like someone was behind me or I was being watched. I sat up in my chair and kind of looked around and saw a head sticking out of the doorway of a patient's room. Yep, it was the smells good person from earlier in the night. As soon as he saw my gaze going that way, he popped his head back into the doorway. I angled my chair so that I could see the room, but it still looked like my head was facing my computer. And every so often, I could see a head popping out of the doorway and then darting back into the room. I tried to ignore it the best I could so I could just finish my shift and go home and get some sleep. I did just that and returned to work the next day to find that the patient from that room had indeed been discharged and when I was getting my new assignments, one of my colleagues said, I heard you made a new friend last night. I asked what they meant and she said, one of your patients that got discharged today, one of their family members were looking for you and asking for you. They wanted to see if you were here and we told them you were gone and We didn't know when your next shift was. When we told him that you weren't here, his face went from a smile to a frown and he just walked away. And we figured you just made a good impression or something. I just smiled at my coworker and went back to reviewing some charts. I will say that things always seem a little more unnerving on the night shift and I've always wondered if that's our subconscious at work or if weird things really do occur more at night. I live in Northern Virginia, a town around an hour outside of DC, and because of corona and quarantine I've been at home with my parents delivering pizza for a job. So far it's been pretty lucrative, at least $50 in tips every night. My store is a local one which makes operations a lot less mechanical and a bit more organic, which serves as both a vice and a virtue. It had been around three weeks since I got hired and I was enjoying my life as the new delivery guy. I love the job, it's one of the best I'd ever had. At the end of the night, perhaps 10 or so minutes before closing, we get an order, of course for a single pizza on the edge of the delivery border. The location looks like an apartment complex way off the main road and my manager asked me, hey, all the drivers are closing, you take that order and just head home, alright? The order is really simple, just an extra large pizza with three extra cheese options. I put the pizza in the sleeve, hop in my car, and begin playing Underworld on the speaker, in the mood to drive fast and kick some butt. 
Now when most apartment complexes are lit up with street lamps, this one had no functioning light sources and the roads leading up to it were very serpentine and steep. After navigating the crooked roads, I finally arrive at the apartment complex. Since the elevator isn't turning on, I have to heave myself up these stairs. I get to the door, and a little porch light is switched on, conveniently lighting up the room number. I can distinguish the sound of two or three children playing around inside. As soon as I knock, the door opens almost instantly. Taken aback, I see a small kid standing in the doorway, probably one of the little dudes playing earlier. I ask him, uh, Hey, little man, are mom and dad home? He answers, No, but big sister is. This kind of put me on edge, as I'm not comfortable having to deal with some little kid and money, but then my attention goes to the kid's clothes. He's wearing pajamas when, while they weren't super tattered or worn out, you could see a streak of this sort of brownish stuff that I took to be chocolate or something. The kid keeps staring at me while I'm getting gradually more uncomfortable, and I ask him, Well, uh, can you go grab Big Sis for me? He looks at me confused and explains, No, she's playing hide and seek. I, can, I can't find her. Do you want to come inside and help me find her? At this moment, I get an actual look at the interior, and I'm just stunned. The room is unbelievably dark, with the walls painted either a dark gray or black, absorbing what little light is produced by this very old block-style TV. You can feel how very cramped this room is, even from outside, and you can smell the awful cigarettes and day-old fish odor wafting out of it. I'm definitely not going inside, so I tell him. Uh, sorry little buddy, I, I can't come inside. It'd be rude and my bosses say I can. The kid looks back into the apartment and yells to his sister. Sis, he won't come inside. I notice that he's got a very concerned look on his face as if though he just got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Suddenly, his face shifts to one of deep intent, almost like he got turned into a trance somehow. And he tells me calmly, She says it's okay, and that she has your money inside. No, I didn't hear anybody here, and it was getting a little bit too disturbing, so I decided it was time to just get away. I nervously say to him, uh, Listen, I'm just going to go ahead and leave this here, okay? I gotta head back to work soon, so... Yeah, have a good night, kid. He loudly retorts, No, you can't go yet. Sister hasn't given you the monies. I can tell that he was visibly upset as he runs through the foyer into the living room, almost disappearing into the darkness. The rancid, fishy cigarette smell from earlier is getting even more intense and along with a pressure unlike I've ever felt before. I'm getting extremely uncomfortable at this point, and I start kneeling to complete the contactless delivery procedure. As I take the pizza and begin setting it on the ground, I notice a single cockroach emerging from the door. I get up to stomp on it as I don't want it getting in the pizza box. As I raise my foot, it ceases moving like it had accepted its fate somehow. As my soul comes in contact with the insect, an ear-splitting, inhuman wail reverberates off the walls of the interior, piercing my eardrums. I remember being overwhelmed by a primal fear and hearing the little kid inside saying something like, Sissy, no, he didn't mean it. I start hearing scuttling from down the hall and I decided to evacuate. I was kind of surprised at my corporate senses being active still as I still took a second to put the pizza on the doorstep before bailing out. As I'm bolting down the stairs, I guess I must have stepped on another cockroach because another shriek chased me down the stairs. I faintly hear the kid's voice giggling. Come back, mister. I have your monies right here. I enter my car and I almost stain my seat right there. I'm sweating so badly after a few attempts, I successfully start the car and bolt out of that curse complex. While driving, I feel nauseous and I arrive at a 7-Eleven parking lot and hurl outside the window. After simmering down, I drive back home and take a long shower. And that's my only real encounter with the paranormal, I guess 
if that really what it was. I can honestly say I never saw anything or had anything touch me, and maybe it was just some kind of elaborate prank from the kids, but I can promise you I will never be delivering within five miles of that apartment, and frankly, I might even quit my job. I never want to risk getting sent near there again. I got a few work-related stories from my hometown I can post. This first one happened when I was a 20-year-old college student. At the time, I worked in a gas station. It wasn't a building by itself either, rather it acted more like a booth that was attached to a supermarket. The booth itself is located a bit off-site on the other side of this huge parking lot, but the supermarket owns it. The booth faces the store, but it has a huge woodland area directly behind it. The door to the booth faces left into the woods, and I know I'm being overly specific, but this is important. So the window in the booth is bulletproof, but only covers the front so you can't see directly to the left or right of the booth. At the time of this experience, I've been working at the station for maybe a few months, when all of a sudden, this nasty storm hit the area one night. The rain was so bad that you could barely see 10 feet in front of you, and it was flooding all over the place. But the supermarket, being desperate for money, refused to close the booth down, so I showed up for my typical 5 to 11 p.m. shift in the pouring rain. Three hours into my shift, the power goes out due to the storm, which by this point has gotten downright apocalyptic. It's pitch black out there, and the rain is coming down hard, so I decided to sit tight in the booth while I wait for a manager or something to either let me go or to fix the power. Of course, this means the phones are down, so I can't call in the store, and nobody in their right mind is buying gas, so I decided to start doing my booth chores like cleaning the counter, counting cigarettes, tidying the drawer, etc. Now, this next part will require a bit more background information, so bear with me. The booth itself is supposed to be locked at all times, but one of the new hires managed to break the key off inside the lock making one of our managers break the lock so we all could get back inside. That lock still hadn't been replaced, but we were told to pretend the door was still locked. The door still had a deadbolt, but I found it annoying to fool with, so I mostly just left it unlocked. Whenever I'd go to open the door, I'd pretend to put the key in and make an audible sound like a lock being opened. Anyway, back to me sitting in the unlocked booth in the pitch black pouring rain. I'm in the middle of my chores when I hear something outside the booth, like a muffled sort of splashing sound. Again, there is zero visibility, so I press my ear against the door and I can clearly hear someone walking around the booth, in the rain, before stopping in front of the door. Before I can kick myself for not locking it, I hear that ksh sound, followed by the most dreadfully quiet couple of seconds. I'm just waiting to die at the hands of some deranged serial killer or crackhead, when suddenly, the footsteps start splashing back into the woods. I quietly soil myself as I race to lock the deadbolt and I wait out my shift. I would occasionally hear the footsteps outside, but it never tried to open the door. Finally, my manager drives over in a truck to close me out for the night. Since I'm still kind of new here, I didn't want to seem like I was delusional or crazy or that I was a crackhead, so I never mentioned it to him or anyone else at the store. A few months later, this kid I was training told me he'd heard footsteps real late one night during a storm, and thankfully, the lock had been replaced since then. I just tell him it was nothing, but not to open the door if he thinks there is something out there. Not because I didn't want to look delusional, but because I can't explain this phenomenon. Now fast forward a couple of months, and I'm still working at the booth. By this point, I'm the second oldest person working there, so sometimes I'd get calls from younger co-workers when they accidentally mess up. On this particular night I was off, but I still got a call from this high schooler who I'll call Rhea. I look at the time and it's 9.30, so I sigh and pick up the phone and before I can even get in a what happened, Rhea is in hysterics, saying something about her trainee being missing and then lots of sobbing. Confused, if not a little agitated that she called me first, I try to get her to call the cops or something if he's been kidnapped, but she insists that she can't call the cops because they wouldn't believe her. So, 
My next line of thinking is to ask her why she hasn't told a manager, and she cries some more and says that they wouldn't understand. More agitated than confused, I agreed to go out there and calm her down. I get dressed, go out there, and park next to the booth. There were no customers around, and the girl was just standing in the booth, staring at the door. She spots me, opens the door, and starts sobbing, telling me to hurry inside. Eventually, I got her to stop crying long enough to tell me what happened. Apparently, she was training this new guy, Matt, who was an older guy, about my age, and she said, The dude felt off, like a robot or something, and kept staring at her all dazed. Several times he would stop talking mid-sentence and ignored her attempts to address it. At this point, she's getting real uncomfortable and is about to call into the store about him when he starts sort of humming, she says. She described it as kind of like as if someone was attempting to imitate a purring cat, like they were breathing heavily and buzzing at the same time. So she reaches for the phone, and he reacts by grabbing her hand and just staring at her. She starts bawling at this point, begging him to stop, and he lets go of her hand, then opens the door, and just sprints off into the woods out of sight. She said he came back a few minutes just before I got there and asked to be let back in, but she refused, so he just ran back into the woods. At this point, I'm either thinking he picked up on the meth phase that the neighborhood was slinging around or that she's being dramatic. Regardless, the story sounded pretty dangerous and we needed to call the cops or something at least. I tell her we're going to call the cops and then we're going to walk outside and wait for them, but she doesn't want to go outside. She says that she can almost feel him waiting out there. Tired, irritated, and not really buying the story, I just say screw it. She can stay in the booth and call the cops while I make sure the tree line is clear. I take this weak little flashlight that I stashed out there after the first story and go outside to start scanning the tree line. I barely begin shining the light around when, suddenly, the hair stands up on the back of my neck as I hear this humming noise. She described it rather well, too, because it sounded kind of like cicadas mixed with breathing. I look inside the booth and she's curled up in the chair, staring to my left. I didn't even look where she was staring, I just immediately booked it back to get inside. But I left the keys with her, and she's not getting up to let me in. I'm pounding on the door while screaming at her to let me in, and the humming stops abruptly as I hear something behind me and to the left. It's Matt. He's standing just on the edge of the trees. My panic intensifies, and at this point, Rhea finally lets me into the booth, and I immediately deadbolt the thing shut. All of a sudden, Matt is right outside asking to be let back in. He says he's sorry, and that he got a bit nervous back there, and he begins circling the booth while he just repeats the same couple of excuses, asking to come in. This continues for maybe five minutes before the cops arrive, and Matt just begins to run off into the woods again. I end up having to explain to both the cops and our manager what happened, leaving out the weird humming. As far as I know, Matt never showed up, so they fired him and Rhea quit eventually, and that was the end of it. I was never particularly close to Rhea since she was still in high school when I was in college, so we never got to talk about what happened. I have no idea what happened that night though. Maybe Matt was just some doped up meth junkie who was capable of making some really weird noises. I'll never know. I guess it could explain why he bolted out of there when the cops began to show up, but that day is still quite a mystery to my mind. I was walking home from the mall on Valentine's Day, feeling pretty good about my day of shopping and indulging in some much needed me time. The sun was starting to set and the sky was a beautiful shade of pink and orange, so I decided to take the long way home to enjoy the peacefulness of the quiet streets and the beauty of the sky above me. I was 25 and excited to be starting a new job at the coffee shop next to my apartment. I had finally moved out of my parents' house and was beginning to feel like my life was going in the direction I wanted it to. I was listening to music through my earbuds but had this nerve-wracking feeling that something was just off. It's like I could feel someone watching me. Almost like an invisible set of eyes were just locked directly to my every move. 
My heart began to race and my breathing became shallow as I quickened my pace and I was desperate just to get home. I looked over my shoulder and, of course, there he was. My ex. The one who couldn't get over me and just wouldn't leave me alone. After we broke up almost a year before this, he did everything he could to convince me to take him back. At first, it was normal stuff like having flowers sent to my home or mailing me sweet letters in the mail. It was romantic and nice and kind of innocent even, but I didn't want to get back together with him so I never responded to any of it. At this point, I hadn't seen or heard from him for a couple of months and I thought that he had finally gotten the hint that it was over between us, but apparently not. He was walking about ten feet behind me and when I looked back at him, I could see this sort of sinister look in his eyes. He had always been a bit creepy, but this was some next level stuff. He didn't say a word. He just sort of smiled this horribly disturbing smile. I tried to ignore him and keep walking, but he started following me more closely, getting closer and closer with each step. I turned a corner, hoping to lose him, but he was still there. And every step that I took, he took the same one only five feet behind me. I started to feel my panic set in. I'd always felt safe walking home alone, but now I felt like I was being hunted or stalked like someone's prey. I pulled out my phone, calling a friend, but she didn't answer. I tried calling my roommate, but still no answer. I was completely alone with no one to help me. I had called the police on him many times before, and the last time they just straight up told me not to call again about him unless it was a life or death situation, and I really didn't want to hear about that again. So I started to run hoping to get to my apartment building before he caught up with me. I could hear him getting closer and closer with every step, and so close that I could even hear his heavy breathing. I was gasping for air and my heart was pounding in my chest, but I knew that I had to keep running. I finally made it to my building and ran inside, but he caught the door and followed me in. I could hear his footsteps echoing down the hall as I ran to my apartment and locked the door behind me once I was safely inside. I was okay. I wanted to scream and cry at the same time, but it wasn't over yet. I tried to calm myself down, but my mind was just racing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to call the police, I didn't want to make a scene, and I didn't want to draw attention to myself. I just wanted it all to be over. I wanted my ex to be one of those guys that just moves on when a relationship ends. My roommate found me curled up in a ball in front of the door and asked me what happened. Through tears and hyperventilation, I told her everything. She was horrified and told me that she didn't care what they said the last time that I had called and that she was calling the police, because being chased home by your psycho stalker ex is in fact life or death. Just as she got a hold of the dispatcher, we heard a noise outside the door. I froze, my heart racing. My roommate and I stared at each other with wide eyes, waiting, listening for any noise coming from outside my door. Was he trying to get inside? I grabbed a knife from the kitchen just in case. The noise stopped and I started to relax a little. My roommate was explaining everything to the dispatcher when suddenly it started again. This time it was louder. It was a loud banging noise but the banging wasn't coming from the door. It was almost like he was stomping around outside the door having a tantrum that he wasn't able to get inside. I would never experienced that side of him and I never knew that he was capable of doing something like this. Throughout our whole relationship, he seemed so normal. The reason we broke up was because he had cheated, and I felt like if he was willing to risk our whole relationship for one night with a random woman, then our relationship didn't mean much to him to begin with. You'd think that he would have been able to move on by the time this all happened. I crept up to the door, knife in hand, and peered through the peephole. I couldn't see anyone, but I could hear someone breathing. It sounded like his mouth was pressed against the door like he wanted to hear it. I started to panic again, but my roommate tried her best to calm me down. The police told us to stay inside and keep the door locked until they arrived. They said it would only take around 10 minutes for them to get there. We sat on the floor and waited for the police. All the while I could hear him still breathing on the other side of the door and I knew that all he wanted was to get inside and do God knows what to me. Finally. The police got there, and they arrested my ex. He didn't put up a fight and went with them willingly. They took him away, and I was finally able to sort of breathe a sigh of relief, but unfortunately, this sort of fear and panic would stay with me for quite a long time. 
No matter how much I wanted to or how convenient it would be, I could never get myself to walk home alone again. I never forgot the feeling of being followed and hunted by someone who had supposedly loved me before. I was lucky to make it out alive, but the thought of what could have happened is something I still think about almost every day. I never thought that someone I once loved could turn into a monster. It's important to always trust your instincts. I learned that the hard way and I hope that my story can serve as a warning to others. It serves as a reminder that sometimes love can just turn into an obsession and that obsession can turn into something much more dangerous. I was so excited to start a new life in the city. My girlfriend and I had just moved into a small apartment and I was eager to explore a place that I'd never been before. I had gone to the grocery store to pick up a few things and as I was walking home I was texting my girlfriend about all the cool things I came across on the walk and all the fun stuff that there was for us to do together around the city. I was so preoccupied with my phone that I didn't even realize that I'd gotten turned around. I don't know how I was stupid enough to not look where I was going, but I was just really excited to tell her about my day and everything I saw. After a while, I finally looked up and realized that I had no idea where I was. The streets were empty and the buildings appeared to look abandoned with their doors and windows boarded up. It kind of looked like something out of an apocalyptic video game, The Last of Us. I was starting to feel uneasy and honestly a little scared. This looked like nothing of the area that I was just walking in not too long ago. I looked at my phone's map and started making my way back in the right direction. I was around four miles from home still and it was getting dark. As I was walking I saw an old car with a taxi sign on top. It was starting to rain and the darkness was engulfing the streets around me, but I still hesitated for a second before getting in. It didn't look like an official taxi and I'd seen way too many true crime shows to trust it, but I just wanted to get home and the thought of being lost in this unfamiliar place was freaking me out way more than getting in the car. I knocked on the window and the driver rolled it down just a little crack and it was enough for me to ask if he was able to take me where I needed to go. He didn't speak just nodded a yes in my direction. He unlocked the doors and I got in and told him to drop me off at the gas station near my apartment building and I gave him the address. The driver started the engine and we were off. I still had my maps app open and glanced at it every so often to make sure that we were going in the right direction. Only the further we drove, I noticed that we had started going in the opposite direction of my apartment. I started to get nervous and asked the driver if he could take me home or even just let me out so I could find another ride but he didn't say a word and instead just kept driving. I started to feel panic set in as the car took me further away from my home. I demanded that the driver let me out and he just sort of chuckled to himself. I tried to open the door but it was locked and didn't have a button to unlock it. It was one of those locks where when the car is locked it retracts into the door and he can't pull it up to unlock it, and I was trapped. I started to feel a cold sweat on my skin as the fear that I was feeling began to fill every inch of my body. The driver drove for what felt like forever, taking me deeper into the outskirts of the city down its darkest, deserted streets. In reality, we probably only drove for around 30 minutes, but the panic and fear that I was feeling in that car made every second feel like hours. The rain was coming down harder and harder, and I could feel the driver's eyes on me through the rearview mirror. He was watching me closely, and it was making me even more afraid. I was trapped in that taxi with a stranger who seemed to have no intention of letting me go. The fear and desperation was overwhelming, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't think of a way out. Eventually, the taxi pulled off to the side of the road, and the driver turned to look at me. He was wearing a black hoodie and I almost wanted to laugh for a second and remembered where I was and decided that that wouldn't be the best idea. I could see a sort of creepy smirk on his face as he spoke to me in a harsh voice. Welcome to your final destination, he said, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I didn't know what to do. I tried to reason with the driver to just let me go and there'd be no harm done but he wouldn't listen. He just laughed as he got out of the car and walked towards the back door. I didn't even know what to think. I had no idea what he was going to do with me. The driver opened the back door and dragged me out of the car by my jacket. He threw me into the gutter and I hit the ground hard. I was in pain but I was still alive. 
I tried to get up and run, but he was fast and caught me, tackling me to the ground. He put a knife to my throat and I was on the verge of tears and I tried to scream, but nothing came out. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice shaking, and the driver just laughed, saying, Why not? I was terrified and I couldn't move. I could feel the cold metal of the knife against my skin. Finally, I was able to muster up a scream loud enough that somehow a group of people nearby were able to hear it. I heard footsteps coming from down the street and thank God that they were getting closer. The man told me to shut up and press the knife harder against my skin. And just when I thought things were over for me, I heard a voice calling out in the distance. Hey, what's going on here? I looked down the street and only about 50 feet away, a group of people were walking towards us. They were watching us and I realized that the driver was beginning to get nervous. His hands began to shake and he got off of me as fast as he could. He turned and ran away on foot, just leaving his car and me laying there on the street, reeling from what had just happened. The group ran towards me and one of the guys helped me up and put pressure on the wound that I didn't even notice that I had on my neck. They called the police and an ambulance took me to the hospital. I needed a few stitches for the laceration of my throat but was otherwise physically okay. The police searched the vehicle and realized that it was stolen and there was nothing in it to tie it to the person who had done that to me that night. Now years later, another man was abducted in the same manner in that area only this time, the man was caught and he was arrested. I was called in due to the correlation in the crime and was able to identify the man as the man who attacked me on that night. And thank God that he was charged and sentenced to seven years in prison. He never admitted to kidnapping anyone else, but we knew that that was probably not true. I tried my best to get over it but the emotional scars will always be there, along with the physical one on my neck. I'm so grateful to the people who saved me, and I'll never forget the fear and desperation that I felt in that taxi, but I'll also never forget the kindness and bravery of the strangers who risked their lives to help me and make sure that I was okay. From that day on, I made sure to always pay attention to my surroundings and never let my guard down again. I lived in Venice, California, and I was walking home from a friend's house late at night. I lived just a few blocks away, but I always felt nervous walking home alone at night. Venice has always been known for its kind of high crime rates and homeless population, and I always made sure to carry my pepper spray with me wherever I went. I had no intentions of becoming a victim in the city like the countless other women that I've heard of before, and everything seemed fine at first. The walk was short, and every now and then I'd pass another person and smile at them. It was late and I was nervous, but I tried my absolute best not to show it. I didn't want to seem vulnerable in any way, shape, or form. I was wearing an old backpack that I'd used in high school instead of carrying my purse to try to deter thieves, and I made sure to put on clothes that didn't show much of my body. There wasn't such a thing as being too careful to me, and as I was walking, I heard a man's raspy sort of smoker's voice behind me. Excuse me, miss. Got any spare change? I turned around to see uh, what appeared to be a homeless man. His clothes were torn up with plenty of holes and his eyes seemed to be wild. It almost seemed like his thoughts were wandering as he was talking. I just shook my head and told him that I didn't have any money and that I was sorry. But he didn't seem to appreciate that. Come on, just a little bit. He persisted, his voice growing more aggressive. A pretty girl like you is bound to have at least a few dollars on her. I hated talking to strangers, let alone a person who was apparently as unpredictable as this guy seemed to be. I didn't want to deal with the situation any longer and decided ignoring his statement would be the best option. I didn't want to upset him any further or make things harder on myself by rejecting his request for money again, so I just whispered a quick, I'm sorry, and started to walk faster away from him, trying to put as much distance between us as I possibly could. The man followed, throwing insults here and there and eventually resorting to making threats. You rich girls always think you're better than us. You're going to regret this. 
I can promise you that. I was scared, and my heart was pounding in my chest. I quickened my pace even more to the point where I was basically running away from the guy, but he was still following me and surprisingly keeping up with me pretty well. I started to hear him getting closer and I was terrified that he was going to attack me or hurt me. I reached into my pocket and I grabbed my pepper spray, ready just in case. I turned around, I pointed it at the man and yelled as loud as I could, leave me alone. I tried to sound brave, but it just came out as some little squeal. The homeless man just laughed in a way that gave my whole body chills. He took a step closer and I aimed the pepper spray directly at his face. Don't come any closer, please. I don't want to hurt you. Just leave me alone and I'll forget this ever happened. I warned and my voice was shaking. But he didn't seem to listen. He just kept coming, and his eyes were just transfixed on me. I hadn't really used it before, but I squeezed the trigger, and a burst of pepper spray shot out, hitting him directly in the face. He screamed, and buried his face in his hands as he stumbled backwards. I started to feel tears in my eyes as well, but I took that moment to run, and my feet pounded against the pavement as I raced back to my apartment. I locked the door behind me. My hands were shaking as I tried to catch my breath. I technically was safe now, but I just couldn't shake the fear that was beginning to creep over me. I knew that I couldn't let the homeless man's insults and threats get to me, but... It was hard to ignore the fear that was beginning to gnaw at me, the fear that he would come back and try to hurt me again. I spent the rest of the night lying in bed, just sort of staring at the ceiling. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that the man was just outside, waiting for me. Now I knew that I should have called the cops right then and there, but I've had issues in the past and unless you're essentially being cooked alive, the cop's response time is just essentially next to never around here. Eventually, days turned into weeks and I started to feel more confident in my life. I started to walk home alone again and I didn't see that guy anywhere. I thought that maybe he had moved to another area and that maybe I was safe now, but I was wrong. One night as I was walking home from work I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. I turned around and there he was again his eyes seemingly blazing with anger, and it was like that entire night was playing over again in my mind, and it was clear that he'd not moved on from it at all. You think you can get away from me? He yelled, and he started to lunge towards me. I let out a scream, reaching for my pepper spray, but it wasn't there, and I suddenly remembered setting it on the kitchen counter and forgetting to grab it before I went out for the day. I turned to run, but he was too fast. He grabbed me, his fingers digging into my skin. I screamed, fighting against him, but he was too strong and his grip was unrelenting. I was screaming, punching, kicking, anything to get the man to let me go, but nothing was working. And just when I was starting to lose hope of escaping unharmed, I see a police car pull up and two officers jump out, rushing towards us. A homeless man released me, and I stumbled backwards as my knees buckled underneath me. The officers were able to apprehend him, taking him into custody, and I was finally safe. I sobbed as the officer told me that I would have to make a formal statement, and after that night, I never walked home alone again. I was too traumatized by what had happened. I never forgot that fear, and it stayed with me. A sort of constant reminder of what could happen when you aren't cautious enough of your surroundings, or really the area that you're living in. Sometimes it's just not safe enough to walk home on your own and there's nothing you can really do about it. The man was charged but received no jail time. I guess the jails in my area were already overpopulated and his charge wasn't a serious one so they informed me that they had to let him free. It didn't make me feel any safer though. Hopefully I'm the last person he ever does that to and no one else has to feel the same fear at the hands of that man. Last month, the strangest and most unsettling thing happened to me while I was delivering a pizza. I started this gig delivering pizzas about six months ago to make some extra cash on the weekends. I'll say this, anybody looking for some extra money should consider delivering pizzas. 
I know it's not glamorous, but depending on where you work, you can make some decent side money. For the most part, I never really had any interesting stories about delivery. I've heard people describe all sorts of things from their experiences. Everything from being invited inside to a party, to someone I used to work with being invited inside after dropping off the pizza and six months later he ended up marrying that woman. But for me, it was always the status quo until a month ago. In the area I deliver, there aren't too many apartment buildings. It's mostly residential neighborhoods and just a few business parks. However, there is a massively large apartment building within our delivery area. The apartments are new, but the building itself is quite old. In the early 1900s, the building was some sort of warehouse or factory. I think they made candles or something random like that, but it mostly had been abandoned for the last 40 years. Now just recently, they renovated the entire building and made these beautiful apartments. They're open and spacious floor plans, and because the warehouse was huge, they were able to add a ton of apartments. I think the cheapest apartment in the entire building is 2100 for one bedroom. Basically, you need to have some money to afford one of these apartments. When Saturday night came and I received a call to deliver a pizza to this building, I was pumped to see it for myself. I had only seen photos up to this point. Ordinarily, I don't love delivering to apartments. It's not the apartment's fault, it's just sometimes it can be annoying trying to navigate which building is the correct one, especially when it's dark out. But not this time. This time, I was excited to deliver to these apartments and selfishly, I was hoping to get a nice tip. The drive should have taken me about 10 minutes, but it ended up being almost 20 minutes due to the horrific weather. It was raining and storming so badly outside that the visibility was almost non-existent. When I arrived at the massive building, I pushed the button for the address of the pizza. They unlocked the door and I stood in the lobby-like room. There were two elevators, one to my left and one to my right. At the end of the room, straight across from me, was another door that led to the stairs. I don't love elevators, so I decided to take the stairs. I got to the floor and started making my way down the confusing corridors. It was like a maze on the floor. I assumed the floor was a giant square with rooms all the way around, but they had a lot of turns that honestly blew my mind. From the outside of the building, it was just a giant rectangle, but inside was like something out of an abstract painting. I was briskly walking down the hall, looking at all the numbers trying to find the address of my delivery. Then, without notice, the power went out. It was completely dark where I was standing. Of course, my cell phone was outside in the car, so I didn't have any light on me. The hallway was completely blacked out. I had no idea where I was. It was as if I entered a funhouse. I tried to use one hand to guide myself on the wall, and the other hand was firmly holding the pizza and wings. If you're afraid of the dark, then this would have been enough to do you in, but unfortunately, it gets worse. In my dwindling composure, I heard a door open slowly, and then close abruptly. It sounded close in front of me, but I literally saw nothing. If someone left their apartment, they weren't using a light to navigate. So I had thought, that was probably whoever ordered the pizza, and they were just checking to see if it was at their door. I decided to shout, Hey, I got your pizza! A brief silence ensued, and... Then a voice emerged from the darkness that had to be no more than ten feet away and said in a low and raspy voice, I didn't order pizza. I stayed quiet and stopped moving. I wanted to turn around and go back to the stairs, but at this point, I had already walked by a ton of doors and I wouldn't know which one was the stairs. As I stood still, hoping that the power would turn on, the voice emerged again, this time right in front of me. I could feel the heat of the breath on my skin, and they said, you're coming with me. Thankfully, I was holding the pizza because this person tried to grab me, but they ended up grabbing the pizza box. I threw the box, turned, and ran back the way I came. I don't know why I wasn't yelling for help. I think I was paranoid to give away my position. As I ran down the blacked out hall, I tried every doorknob I passed until I found one that wasn't locked, and thankfully it was the stairs. The stairs had these emergency lights, so I was able to faintly see where I was going. I ran outside, got into my car, and drove back to the pizza shop in the rain. I told my boss everything, and we decided to call the police. The person who ordered the pizza called furious that their order was thrown out in the hallway, but I didn't care. I gave my statement to the police who informed the apartment management, but 
As of writing this a month later, nothing has happened. I did find out that the floor I was on was also supposed to have these working emergency lights, but for some reason, they didn't operate. I'm still not sure if this was some cruel joke to play on someone in the dark, or if the strange person intended to harm me. Either way, I'm thankful my pizza box saved my life that night, and at this point, I'm just happy I have an insane delivery story I can finally share. If anything happens, I will for sure write up follow-ups, but at the moment, there is a demented man in the darkness just waiting to strike. I've worked at a graveyard for the past 15 years. Most of those years being the typical graveyard shift, which was from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. In my mind, working overnight had way more benefits than working during the day. Day workers had more to do, since more people would be visiting the yard. There would also be burials taking place a few times a week that need to be arranged. And, above everything else, night shift gets paid an extra $2 an hour. I've seen a lot during my years working night shift though, mostly teens messing around or the occasional drunk group of friends daring each other to walk through the yard. However, this night was different. I got to the small faculty building a bit early to chat with the day worker, and once he left, I did all of the normal checks and precautions at the beginning of my shift. Afterwards, my only job is really just to drive around in a golf cart every so often and just make sure nothing's going on. I'd say I only encounter something once a month, or maybe even every other month. Anyway, the first few hours were normal. I drove around several times, then went back to the small faculty building to eat my lunch. I think it was around 2am when I went back out to do another round of the yard. As I got to the far end, I saw something by the fence. It was obviously really dark, so I couldn't see much more than the general shape of a figure standing there. I drove up closer. I could tell now that it was a man standing on the outside of the fence, looking toward me. I didn't want to confront him if I didn't have to, so I turned and drove in a small loop around the lot to see if he would try to hop the fence while I was gone. But when I got back after 30 seconds, he was gone. I scanned the area briefly to make sure he didn't sneak in, but it all looked clear, so I continued with my patrol. Going through the whole yard takes about 15 minutes, but sometimes I'd go slower just to pass the time. I went all the way around and decided to check back on the spot where I saw the man. I really didn't have anything better to do anyways. I started driving down there, and almost immediately, I spotted the man again. He was inside the yard, standing on the gravel path. I drove up closer again, but the man didn't move. I exited the golf cart and started walking up to him. He looked like a 40-year-old man. I stopped just a few feet away from him. Sir, you can't be in here. I need to escort you out, I said, but he didn't even turn his head to look at me. After a second, a slight rush of fear went through me. Sir, I need you to come with me. I reached out my hand gently to tap his shoulder. As soon as I did, he whipped his head around to look at me. He just stared into my eyes. He looked full of rage. I took my hand away and the man turned around and started walking away. I got back in my golf cart, preparing to call the police, as I watched him go all the way down to the fence. He stepped over it and continued walking away. I was relieved but still terrified. I drove straight back to the faculty building and went inside. It was a small, single room, security type building but I felt a lot safer and calmer inside. I sat down and caught my breath. In all my years, I'd never really been scared because it was always just people messing around, but this was different. I waited inside for a while, I'm not sure how long, until I heard a bang on the door. 
I jumped out of my chair and stared at the door in fear. A few seconds later, they banged on the door again. These were aggressive knocks, not those of someone friendly. I had nowhere to go. I picked up the desk phone and called 911. I didn't know what they wanted or why they were here, but I wasn't going to risk it all to find out. After probably three minutes of them banging on the door, I heard them walk away. I still waited for the police to arrive before I opened the door. The following day, my manager was able to pull the CCTV security footage from the building. What I saw was horrifying. Just minutes after I entered the building, the man I'd seen in the yard earlier walked up to the door. He stood there silently for nearly 15 minutes before he banged on the door. He was also holding something in his hand, but the footage wasn't detailed enough to make out the object. It was likely a small pipe or bat of some sort. The man was never identified, but I still work the same job at the graveyard and haven't seen him since. I'd been working the night shift at the gas station for almost a year at this point. It's not the best job, but it pays my cheap bills. The hours are long and the work is repetitive. I thought many times about quitting and finding work somewhere else, and this incident was my breaking point. It was a typical night at the gas station. I had just finished cleaning off the pumps and restocking the shelves when I saw the headlights of a car pulling into the lot. It was an old, beat up car. As the car pulled up to the pump, I could see that there was only one person inside. He got out and started walking up to the door. It was a man, probably in his mid-thirties. He had dark hair and was wearing a black leather jacket and looked like he hadn't slept in days. I greeted him with a smile and asked him if he needed any help. He didn't say anything, but just threw a 20 on the counter and went back out to fill up his tank. It was a bit rude, but that's normal when working at a gas station, especially late at night when nobody wants to talk. I watched out the window as he filled up his tank but a couple minutes passed and he was still there with the pump in his car. I knew he only put $20 in, so he had to have finished a while ago. I waited another couple minutes, then I opened the door and started to say something, asking if he needed any help, but he just got back in his car and drove away. I blew it off and went back inside the store, but as the night wore on, I started to feel like something was off. I don't know how else to describe the feeling. Nobody else was pulling in to get gas and it was really quiet outside. Then I heard a noise coming from the back of the store. It sounded like a box falling off a shelf. I slowly made my way to the back of the store. As I turned the corner, there was a man standing there going through our inventory. He was tall and looked like he hadn't showered in weeks. I froze in fear, not sure what to do. The man turned and saw me, and for a moment, we just looked at each other. Then he started to walk towards me, his eyes fixed on mine. I backed away slowly, putting my hands up as if to not mean any harm, but he kept coming towards me. I could smell alcohol in his breath, and I knew that he was dangerous. Money, where is it? He said, slurring his words. I saw in one of his hands he had a switchblade, and with him being clearly drunk, I was really scared. I pointed toward the register. As I was opening the till, the man wandered around the store, making his way to the liquor section. He stashed a few expensive bottles in his backpack, then came back to the register. I put all the bills we had on the counter being barely over a hundred dollars. The man looked at it, then looked at me. The f is this? I need more, man. He wasn't satisfied, but there was no more money to give. He flipped open his blade, waving it around and yelling at me. 
I was sure he was going to jump the counter and beat me to death. But then, he suddenly swiped the cash and bolted out the door. My heart was pounding as I looked out the window, seeing that same beat up car from earlier. The man got inside and they drove off. The police came a few minutes later, responding to the emergency button I pressed while the man was browsing the booze, but they weren't too helpful right away. Thankfully though, the cameras outside the building were able to pull a license plate from the car, and four days later, I was informed that both men were caught. Apparently they were homeless and had stolen the car. They then went on a crime spree, robbing as many stores as they could, mostly just of alcohol and money. I feel pretty lucky to have made it unharmed, because their erratic behavior sent one worker to the hospital after an encounter with them. A couple weeks later though, I quit my job and moved to work in the day shift somewhere else. I'm a receptionist at a local hotel and most of my shifts are overnight. I'm in charge of the front desk and my main responsibilities are to check in guests, answer phone calls, and keep an eye on the security cameras. It's usually a pretty quiet job since our hotel isn't the biggest or busiest. This night, the hotel was mostly empty. There were only a few guests staying with us. I was sitting at the front desk on my phone when I saw a man start walking towards the doors outside. I stood up and greeted him when he came inside. He looked up at me with bloodshot eyes and said, I need a room for the night. He was definitely high on something, but regardless, I checked him in and gave him a key to his room. It was standard to allow walk-in bookings when the hotel was less than 75% full. He started walking toward the elevators, and I sat back down and pulled my phone out. A few hours later, I was sitting at the front desk when I heard a noise coming from the hallway. It was a thump sound, like a door trying to be forced open. I got up and walked around the corner to the end of the hallway. The man I checked in a few hours ago was standing there, trying to open up one of our maintenance doors. Can I help you find something? I asked. He looked over at me with those creepy eyes. I asked again, but he just stared at me. I wasn't really sure what to think. Maybe he was really high and looking for the vending machine or something. I don't know. I didn't want to anger the man though, so I went back to my desk and forgot about it. A good amount of time passed with no activity. No sounds from any of the rooms, nobody entering the building or walking through the halls. It was around 3 in the morning, and I did a small walk around the bottom floor just to keep myself awake and busy. As I got to the hallway by the front desk though, I heard a very sudden, loud banging coming from one of the rooms. I stopped and listened for a moment, then went up the stairs to the second floor, where I thought it came from. It was very quiet now, which made me somewhat nervous. I walked down the hall, hearing nothing, but when I reached the end, one of the room's doors was open. I listened again for a second, before lightly knocking. Nobody responded. I cautiously peeked inside, unsure of what to expect. It seemed empty. I wasn't comfortable walking all the way inside though, so I couldn't really look around, but I was sure nobody was inside. I closed the door and looked at the room number. That was the room I'd given to the man. I never saw him exit the building though. I quickly walked back down to the front desk. I looked at all the security cameras we had in the lobby and outside the building, but the man didn't turn up. I jumped. It was the hotel phone. One of the rooms was calling. I picked it up. Hello, how can I help you? There was a woman on the line, 
telling me about some man knocking on her door in the middle of the night. I apologized and assured her I would take care of it. I hung up and took a deep breath. I was getting really nervous now. I walked around the desk, but then again, the phone started ringing. It was someone else from a different room this time, saying he had the same experience as the other woman, someone knocking at his door in the middle of the night. I called the police right away. I stood by the front doors until they arrived, just in case I needed a quick escape. Luckily they came before anything happened, but they didn't find the man. Instead, they found a broken window in his room, where he likely jumped out of. It was on the second story though, so I'm not sure how he managed to get away without some major injuries. Later, while the police were still searching, they got a report that the car he used to pay for the room was stolen. It's unclear what the man intended to do, or why he was knocking on people's doors. I'm thankful none of them opened their doors though, because this case could have been much worse if they had. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. See you on the next video.